I have to do this on the very first class because as you can see, this is all going to be videotaped and live streamed and for that matter broadcast on television in San Francisco. So you don't really need to come to class after this. Um, you're welcome to come to class and I certainly prefer to be in physical attendance at a class, but in practice at least half the students don't bother much because they've got other things going on. And you don't if you attend live, you can connect from home into connecting the City College live stream. And when we get to the Kahoot, you can connect to my Zoom to get them without a one-minute delay. They have a one-minute delay on this thing like they do in all commercial broadcasts because they have to stop it in case someone uses a bad word. Um, and uh, the only, uh, if you can even just watch videos of this, which will be on YouTube, you can watch them another day if you want to, or you can indeed ignore the lecture entirely and just read the book. As long, all, all your grade comes from uh, online quizzes and homework that you send in. And so, yeah, you had a question? The live streaming, is there some place to read about how to do that if I'm... Yeah, right. Yeah, if you go to my homepage, samsclass.info, and let me put it up here because I don't have any paper to give you today since all the copiers are broken. Oh! <laughs> all of them? What? Yes. Well, that's normal for this part of the semester, although what's happened in the last six months is the person in charge just quit doing it and was not replaced, which is a special feature of the City College management yeah. system. Yeah. But anyway, um, so if you go to samsclass.info and click on 152, you get this is the all-important thing which gives you the information about this class. And down here it tells you where to go to get the live stream. The live stream is there, at that impressive URL. And the other stream that I put up during Kahoot's is down here, which you'll see later. Um, and this also tells you where the quizzes are. The quizzes are on a Canvas system, but it's not the official City College Canvas system because they maintain that the same way they maintain the copiers and I'm not <laughs> using it anymore. Um, it's, I got my own one elsewhere. Um, and, and because I have another one, so you'll, you already should have received an email inviting you to it. If not, you'll get one after you add. And uh, you can take quizzes there. You'll find an invitation email inviting you to it. It's here. It's on a different free set of servers called instructure.com. So there's the textbook. And so we've got a bunch of quizzes and homework. Uh, the, you should take the quizzes before the appropriate lecture. So I recommend you start doing quizzes this week and do them before next week. But I'm not going to take any points off until after the add date because people are still adding probably. If anybody came to add, if you're on the waiting list, I already emailed you an add code. If you still need an add code, I've got them. Anybody can add. There's no limit to how many people can be in the class because you don't all have to physically fit in the classroom. Um, we do have an on-computer, an on-site computer lab you can work in if you want to in Science 214, but most students prefer to use their own laptop. Um, but we do have, they'll have open lab hours probably starting about next week. Anyway, there's quizzes and projects you do. The projects in my other classes used to come in by email, but I'm beginning a new system. And this system works like this. You do this project, you get, get a Kali virtual machine going, and when you're done, you fill in this form. All you do is put your email here and answer a secret question to prove that you did the project, and click CCSF or non-CCSF. For you folks, it would be CCSF. It will put your score right in Canvas. This is one of the reasons why I moved off the City College system. Canvas has an API. So I can send data right into Canvas from external apps, and that's what I'm doing. I can't do that with the City College Canvas, but I can do it with mine. Is that hackable? Yes, probably. And if you hack it, you'll get extra credit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. If you guys figure out how to hack Canvas, go for it. But so um, that means if someone submitted something, I could submit something for them, they get an F. Uh, well, the only, the only thing my form does is give you the official number of points. But if you find a way to subvert it, that would be awesome. And that reminds me. But turn uh, it in so you get points. No, no, so you turn in, you turn in the wrong way, you get no points, right? That reminds me, for anybody who hasn't taken my classes before, there's a disclosure policy. If you find a way to hack any of my stuff, that's fair game. Hall of Fame. Yes, you get on the hall. As long as you make reasonable efforts not to hurt anybody and not to hack some other part of the college, but just my stuff, then you get extra credit and you get on the Hall of Fame and a bunch of people have done it. Here's a bunch of people that have, uh, back here at the bottom, there's a list of all the people that have hacked me so far. So you could, you could be on the Hall of Fame for having hacked me in various ways. These guys got root on my server and put a banner on it. Uh, this guy snuck up behind me and videotaped me typing in my password. That's a pretty good attack. That's real hard to stop, real powerful. There's lots of ways to do it. 
And uh, if you manage to hack my canvas, that would be swell. But of course, what I say, you have to try not to hurt anybody. Try not to interrupt the class any more than necessary. And let, and let me know privately so but, I can fix it. That's the only way that would work is you'd have to make two dummy accounts for people to hack. So they could override sure. someone's score or well, do something. You, you, and your, you and your friend could hack each other's well, account or something. When you hack it, do it by creating the dummy account so the rest of us can hack those. Oh. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, yeah. yeah right. Anyway, that's um, all right. And I have a, uh, so the first six projects are here and there will be more up to about 17. And um, I have a grading policy, which is very simple. I normally have to hand it on on paper, but our lack of copiers means I won't have the printouts till next week. But as you can see, it's pretty boring stuff. There's a bunch of quizzes and projects and a final exam, and then you just have a grade based on the number of points you made. There's a bunch of extra credit stuff too. And if you go do off-campus training events or CTFs or something, they're all worth extra credit. Just let me know about them. Things like RSA and, uh, and you know, if anybody is doing something unethical, uh, I can punish them or throw them out of the class as needed. I haven't had to do that very much, but occasionally you get a nut in here. And back in 2012, uh, the members of Anonymous and LulzSec were very angry at me, and they repeatedly threatened to sneak criminals into my class just to defame me and get the classes um, shut down. And they didn't actually do that, but certainly it could happen. So there are a certain amount of criminals wandering around, although most of them don't take college classes. <laughs> um, I've had a few shady types come by when they find out you like have to take quizzes and turn <laughs> What is this nonsense? I wanted to steal something. <laughs> As you know, there are places you can go to learn that, but this is really not what we focus on. Anyway, all right, so the point of this is incident response. And incident response is a field that has branched out from computer forensics. I used to teach computer forensics, and now we have two classes, computer forensics and instant response, which is the direction I wanted to go in. And in my opinion, the computer forensics should go towards in case certification. Alan's working on that, and we'll see, which I think would be good. Uh, that's the criminal side of forensics. That's what police departments use and large corporations to find the crime on their network. And instant response is a different specialty similar, but it has the same property of trying to find out what happened when a bad thing happened on your computer network. You have to go find the evidence. The difference is typical old-fashioned computer forensics focuses on proving criminal guilt in court. That's what it was designed for, so it primarily focuses on an image of the hard drive and all the files on the hard drive because the hard drive files have an owner and a timestamp, so you can record who did what at what time. And um, when you the point of instant response is focusing primarily on the advanced persistent threats, which is criminals infiltrate your network and now they take over more and more servers until they have many forms of malware, many hidden accounts, many things happening on your network before you find out. And now you have to somehow untangle this mess across many systems and you can't possibly use hard drive images to do that because one hard drive image is about a week of work to analyze. And if you have 10,000 machines on a giant network, you can't possibly do it that way. You've got to use faster techniques that do simple queries over the network to find out which machines are infected by looking for what's called indicators of compromise, which are small things that you can easily detect, like the presence of one file, the presence of one registry key, the presence of a certain kind of network traffic. Just a few facts, not everything, not the whole log or the whole hard drive, but a few questions, give me these, and then I can tell which machines have been compromised by the enemy and therefore have to be fixed. Anyway, so that's the point, and this is another Mandiant book. This is the second class I teach based on Mandiant stuff. Mandiant invented this whole thing. They invented the whole advanced resistant threat response. They were the first and biggest company involved before FireEye bought them. And Kevin Mandia contributed to two books. Um, the book I use for practical malware analysis is not by Kevin Mandia, but it is the Mandiant technique um, of how to analyze malware and figure out how it works. And I'm also teaching that this semester. I think it's tomorrow or well, Thursday. I forget what day it is, but pretty soon. And um, this is instant response. Again, the Mandiant technique of doing it. They invented all this stuff and they have the standards and the more and more jobs are available in instant response. So let me start with this first chapter and uh, got, we'll see how far I get before I should take a break, but I may be able to finish this, but not very long. Anyway, um, all right. And all these slides are on that same page. Everything in class should be on my web page. So we'll talk about a couple of real world incidents and this is kind of funny. It is painfully obvious what at least the first one of these is. But they have been slightly anonymized, I guess, to prevent technically admitting the truth. So here's 
So an event is anything that happens on your network. Like, uh, but that's not an incident, it's a security incident. This is a violation of security policy. Something bad that happened on your network, something that means uh, some kind of harm is being done to your company. And so the first thing you have to do is decide if an incident has occurred. And this has to be someone knowledgeable and authoritative enough to declare an incident. This is like pulling the fire alarm, like declaring a state of emergency. This means I'm now going to allocate resources, shut down servers, cause service interruption, you know, cost the company real money now. So you don't just do this casually. Somebody in authority has to say, this is a real incident. We really have to mobilize our incident response team. Then you try to do detection and containment. First, you try to find out what happened, and you try to somehow put out the fire so it does not continue getting worse. Then you have to decide how big it is, um, how many servers are infected. You know, it usually starts with something simple, like somebody can't get their email. And you don't know if that means one machine is broken, or the email server is down, or an enemy has taken over all your servers and all your laptops and are doing something horrible. It could be, and you have to decide how much, how big is the scope, how many machines are infected. Now, um, people that do not have a coherent incident response plan usually have normal system administrators just told to fix it, so they'll do something like just re-image one server and call it done, and that usually. That's appropriate if you have a problem on one server, like a, hard, like a hard disk failure. It's really not appropriate with an advanced persistent threat because they have 10 other ways in, and all that does is uh, tell them that you've noticed them, and now they'll dig in deeper. So um, that's the whole point of the Mandiant way, is you have to think about this more carefully, and you have to analyze the situation first before you try to mitigate, which is Hard to sell to management, but it's now been the standard for several years, and the product companies are wising up to it, that instead of seeing a roach in the hall and stepping on it and calling the problem solved, first you analyze where are they, how many are they, how do we get rid of them all? You have to find it all and then kick them all out at once. That's the only way you actually get rid of these advanced resistant threats. And that's the game here. It's in the long run, you want to do the minimum harm to your business and network operations. And one trick I heard one of my Mandiant guest lectures talk about is they had a company where they uh, they found that the bad guys were stealing credit card numbers right now. And they said, you can't let them keep doing that, even while you're analyzing it. So what they did was they added a little random number generator to the network traffic so the numbers they got would be corrupt. So they couldn't continue to steal any real numbers, but they wouldn't know they were onto them. They just think there was a network problem to delay them for a while while they could analyze and find out the rest of the problem. Uh, you want to minimize the damage, then restore normal operations, and now you've got a public relations issue. You've got to say something to the press, something to your customers, something to your business partner, something to the government regulators that regulate your business. Everybody has to know, we got hacked, what did you do about it? Who got hurt? What do we all have to do now? Yeah? Is there is any one of those, I guess, would, would scope also contain how long you've been compromised? Like, if you notice you've been compromised, and then you're like, oh, wait, has this been going on for a week? Do we just notice this? Has they been here for like six months? Because a lot of networks, they don't always get it right away. They've been there six months or a year, and they find Oh, yes. Well, this is a very good point. Uh, here's a couple of things about saying how long you've been hacked. The first thing is the average company, uh, I think it's 280 days before they detect an intrusion. And most of them probably never detect it at all. Um, most companies have no network visibility and monitoring, so they do not know when they've been hacked. Um, when they do disclose it, they often do not give much information. And as far as I know, there are no actual rules about how much information you must put out, even breach disclosure. Um, so it is companies vary greatly. When LinkedIn got hacked, they just lied for two weeks saying it wasn't them, and it was me and many other people looking through the dump saying, dude, that is my password. Don't tell me you didn't get hacked until they were humiliated and admitting they'd been hacked. But their original response was, well, we asked our lawyer, and our lawyer said, we don't have to do anything, so we're not going to do anything. We're going to just leave the network the way it is, leave us hacked, leave the enemy stealing stuff, and just pretend it's fine. And they tried to do that for about six months before somebody bullied them into doing something about it. But it's, um, it's really not clear what you have to do, and people vary greatly. Yeah? Doesn't the new law in the European Union change that a lot? Oh, yes. Europe does. Absolutely. GDPR or GPDR. That, GDPR that, yeah. that, one, that one changes everything. And many, many companies are refusing to accept European customers for a while because they say it would be so burdensome to deal with it. Yes, they're all hopefully having to improve their security and, uh, in, and transparency to meet that law. But it hasn't really happened yet. Yeah. But, you know, we have this kind of same rule in the United States. PPAR, PHI data is, you know, you, you have to do, you know, announce to the public as well. If the PHI data, PPAR protected data is, 
is reached or such a thing. But there are some rules. It's not, it's not for everything. There are some rules, but they don't seem to go into detail about how long you've been hacked and what you did oh, about yeah. it. Such. Yeah. With the reality winner, did they get her through those uh, laser printer dots, or was it something simpler well, like uh, printer log? Oh, I don't know quite how they got her. She was one of the leakers like Stoughton. And, but yeah, they. I don't quite know what happened with her. Anyway, so uh, then you've got... You may have to, uh, some people might want to take legal action against the people that hacked you. Uh, this is what government and law enforcement agencies do. Uh, most private companies have given up on this. It does, what good does it do you to prove that China hacked you or that some guy in Texas hacked you? That doesn't help you any. Just lock them out. Um, and you know, most of, the, most of the just don't care at all to prove who hacked you. That's not productive because if one guy did it, some other guy can do it too. So you just want to improve your defenses and call it a day. Um, you have to educate your management and you have to improve your security so that attack won't work anymore. That's all you can do. And maybe five or six years ago, people used to pretend they never got hacked. And I know the large banks are still pretending this. Because when I, when I had security issues to raise with all the top banks a few years ago, they wouldn't talk to me at all. And the, the security officers of several of the major banks came and talked to me privately at a security conference and said, we, we can't admit that we, were, that we have a problem. We can't even admit we came to this conference. Well, our public relations office has to pretend that we never go to hacking conferences. We have no security issues at all because the public believes that. That was, uh, and apparently that is true. Just like they vote Republican, they, they believe strange things. They believe that banks are just safe. And if they were to talk about security issues, they would not go to that bank anymore because they think they're, they're dangerous. Of course, they're all getting hacked just like everybody else. But apparently they have to maintain a public face of, of total denial. Anyway, um, well, I, IP rotations. How often do people just, oh, I have to keep my mail server with the same IP or keep something else? In. You think there's going to be a problem with IP shuffle and you know rotation? No, I haven't heard of that. As far as I know, people keep the same IP address in their servers forever. After they've been attacked to like. Oh, sure. To moving, moving them is a, the only time I've ever heard of anyone deliberately <coughs> moving their address is to stop a denial of service attack for just a few hours. That's it. That's the only case I've ever heard. Moving to another address doesn't really do anything in the long run because you move, repoint your DNS servers, your DNS addresses to the new address. People have to be able to find you. And I mean, you could segment your network into two pieces. So oh. we're like, you know, accessing the internet is one group of IPs going out, and then oh. your mail server and your other stuff that can't be changed, oh, you that's, have to keep it. Well, that is absolutely true. You definitely need to segment your network and uh, limit internet access to only the servers that need it. That's a very good hygienic policy, and everyone does that. Everybody smart does that. Uh, anyway, so you have an investigation team that figures out what happened, and then you have a remediation team that fixes what happened, and they have to reject the hacker by finding all the backdoors they're using to get in and all the vulnerabilities they use to get in and kicking them off, and then you have a public relations team that is notifying everybody of what happened. I already mentioned this at the beginning. The old-fashioned forensics focus primarily on hard disk images, but instant response almost never uses that because it's too much data, it's too slow. You use live response, which is queries you do over the network to ask the server for a few facts, usually not even a complete dump of the memory or a complete dump of the hard drive, just queries that say, do you, have you made this network connection? Do you have this file on the disk? A few targeted things to look for indicators of compromise, which you have found. So here's the first case, which is incredibly obviously Target, in my opinion. But they avoid using that name. However, here's what happened. So in January, they found a SQL injection vulnerability on the web server. 11% of the web is vulnerable to SQL injection. It's easy to do. And uh, so they got in. Once they were in, they were then able to get command execution because of XP command shell is the Microsoft. If you use Microsoft SQL, there is a XP command shell routine that gives you a command prompt on the server through SQL injection. On Linux boxes or Oracle, it's a few more steps to get command injection from SQL. Now you can execute commands on that one server, not as administrator, but with the privileges of the SQL server. So now you put malware on that server and execute it. Now, as Kirk was just pointing out, you normally have network segmentation. So for your critical servers that have private data are not allowed to connect directly to the internet. They only go to some public facer in a DMZ. So if I come in from the internet through SQL injection, I'm only supposed to be able to compromise untrusted machines anyway, like the web server and email server, which are sitting in the demilitarized zone. That's the whole point of it. And these you don't put any secrets on because you know they're very likely to get attacked and hacked. Then you have a firewall before you get to the internal environment that has your real crown jewels, like your customer credit card numbers and your intellectual property and stuff. And this firewall is supposed to isolate this network from that one so that people can't get through unless they prove that they're really a company employee. But 
they didn't configure this firewall correctly. It had a weakness, so they were able to execute SQL commands inside the network from the web server. And so that defense was not as strong as it should have been. And of course, the point is, nobody's perfect. And every, every defense and every device has various mistakes in it, and that's why people get in. So once they got in, they then spent weeks doing recon of the environment. And um, for the first week, they used SQL injection. Then they put on a back door. They managed to get a password hash and cracked it. And now they had a local administrator account hash. And most corporate networks ghost all the machines from the same image. So they all had the same administrator password. So once you find one, you can get a local administrator on every machine. This is standard practice. So then they take the domain control. The domain controller is the heart of all Windows networks. This has all the passwords for the whole company, and it's the highest value target. And most penetration tests, um, their goal is to get domain admin. That means you can totally control the company, steal everything, send email. So we got in here, uh, got on the domain controller, and now, um, by mid-February, they put on 20 back doors. Now, this is what serious attackers do. Now, there are punks, like the anonymous hackers that hacked Sony, where they just want to do something like put a, a mocking image on the web page and then brag about it, and that's all. They're just like throwing a rock through a window. It's not very harmful. It's just sort of a trick. But these guys are professionals that want to make money, so they don't just put in one back door. They install 20 families of malware because they don't want you to find them and kick them out. So if you find one and clean it off, there's a bunch of backups. So they got in with a custom creation kit. These are incredibly easy to do. I, a few years ago, I did a project of trying to sneak malware through hashed antivirus engines, and it is incredibly easy. You can do it with Python. If you have any, you don't have to be very smart at all. Just scramble it a little bit, and the antiviruses can't find it. Antivirus is pathetic. The current uh, success rate of antivirus is reported at 3%. <laughs> and most, uh, this is a fun, here's a fun statistic. If you ask amateurs what they trust to protect them, they trust antivirus. If you ask professionals, it's not even in the top 10. <laughs> what professionals trust is updates, which is why it is really a sin and a shame that for the last year, Microsoft updates have been horrible and broken your machine so you can't use them because that really is the most important thing is to update your stuff. But when the updates are no good, you're pretty much hosed. And that's where we're at. But anyway, um, so... They snuck in this thing, got full control. Now they were able to send RDP traffic into the environment. RDP is Microsoft's limited licensed form of Citrix used to control Microsoft servers. You get a desktop environment, you can use it. So they now could control these, and they used encrypted traffic with RC4, which is a simple, small encryption technique that's fairly commonly used by malware. Um, so that you now have um, command and control center data. This is what you do. You take over machines, then you have a server, which is your command and control server, and it's sending orders to them and receiving information from them and commanding your botnet army. Um, now they have to have persistence. Persistence means that you will retain ownership of the machine even if they are restarted. So you have to have some kind of automatic starting process, and this particular one used dural dill search order hijacking, which is an old companion Trojan trick, and it's very close to what we use to hack the um, nuclear isotope separators in Iran with Stuxnet. This we'll talk about more in the malware analysis class. This is the number one most common way Windows malware works is by using these DIL files because DILs are library code that is added to a running process later. So it is having a perfectly fine running process and you can just say, oh, let's add this virus on it and Windows will just do that. So it's really handy for bad guys. It saves RAM and hard disk space, which is why Microsoft does it, but it does lower your security quite a lot. Anyway, so now they had, uh, ah, they connected through a proxy server now. Um, this is what you have to do. To, once, you, once you get in a corporate network, you take over a public facing server like a web server, then you somehow tunnel through the DMZ into the database server, then you finally get to the crown jewels, and those machines can't connect directly to the internet. So once you steal something, it's hard to get it out. You have to find a way to sneak it back out through all the servers, and for that you need proxies. You set up proxy servers on some of the boxes so they will forward traffic to another box, and you try to make it subtle so it looks like ordinary innocent traffic. So they tunneled the traffic through DNS queries and responses. This is very commonly done. If you want to sneak secrets out of a network, um, you have DNS queries going on all the time. So if I have a normal web page, and I go to say like yahoo.com, then this will make a DNS search for that domain name, yahoo.com. But if I wanted to sneak data out of here, I would do something like this, this long, horrible mess 
.yahoo.com. And this is not the real name of a page. This is encrypted data I'm stealing, like passwords or a piece of a PDF file. And it goes out as a DNS request. And it will then get a response of whatever type I program my server to give it. So it will look like ordinary DNS traffic, but it's actually sneaking data out of the network. And you can do the same thing with HTTP. You can put long page names or long folder names. And this is actually, there are tricks to detect this. You can actually calculate the length of DNS measures. We'll be doing it in the DNS security class. And when you are infected with malware, you often suddenly have really large DNS requests, which is not normal, because it's actually bogus DNS requests sneaking secrets out of your network. But that's one of many techniques to sneak stuff out of your network. And by March, they stole data many times. They took usernames and passwords. They stole the network diagram. They got a lot of information. And then they decided to steal financial data. So they made um, an outward FTP connection to an FTP server, and they started uh, stealing data. Now, once you steal data, you can't just send it out in the plain text, or you'll probably get caught. So you zip it. And there are many zip formats. Zip, RAR, and CAB are some of the techniques used to just zip things up so they're harder to detect. And so they found a jump server. They found a gateway that would lead you into the restricted financial environment because it was a properly segmented network. They had a web server in the DMZ, they had an internal environment here, but the thing that actually handled money was, again, hidden by another firewall, and they managed to get in there and get, a, get control of a jump server that would give them a path into that network. So now they're trying to steal credit card data, which is what got stolen from Target, and I know they got stolen with this technique, which is why I think this is pretty obviously Target. Um, Target, the data was stolen from the RAM of the payment instruments, which is a devastating technique. In the first few projects, you'll be doing that here. Um, this is a sin and a shame, really, because in 2004, Microsoft added a data type to Visual Studio so you could store data like a credit card number, and it would automatically erase it from RAM when you were done using it. So it wouldn't just hang around in RAM to get stolen, but people just don't use it. And I remember I did this at Hope maybe six years ago. You can totally steal passwords from RAM. If you log into a web account, even though it encrypts the network traffic, it stores your password in plain text in RAM. And I can just steal the RAM and find your password in there. And you can totally find the credit card numbers in there. So it found track one and track two data in there. Uh, track one data in, in credit cards is there's two tracks of magnetic data. Track one gives you everything you need to clone the card. Track two gives you just enough to do card not present transactions because you don't get the CVV. Um, number, which is that three-digit number or four-digit number that's Pass printed on the card. Yeah, which you're supposed to collect also to make sure they really have the card. But anyway, um, once they've got it, um, the domain administrator did, did not have two-factor authentication. Uh, by the way, uh, last week Google announced that I think for a year they have forced everybody at Google to use YubiKeys. So there's a USB thing they have to use in addition to their password. And they said ever since they did that, not one person can fish them anymore. So that is a really good idea, to use real two-factor authentication. Then it is much harder for the bad guys to get in. But a lot of people still don't do it, and these guys didn't do it, and so they got hosed. Um, and again, they spent a long time doing recon, spent months finding the systems that processed cardholder information, and they made a bunch of prototype things to steal some RAM from this process and RAM from that process, looking to see which one of them might have the credit cards in it. And um, they sent it out through various techniques. All the slides are on my website, too, if you want to get them. I'm sorry. Yeah. Bad habits because in other fine. classes and other schools, they well, that's fine. some of the slides. Well, that's fine. Anyway, anyway, you're welcome. You can do that. It's fine. It's, I just thought I'd mention I know you all think I'm crazy, but oh, no. I've been able to back up some stuff that got lost in Besides, situations. being crazy in this field is generally a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> being paranoid in particular. It's not bad. Being, being paranoid is, by the way, highly recommended. Yeah. Anyway, so um, all right. So now they've got proxy connections through all these different techniques, ways to sneak out on. Looks like they're sneaking this stuff out as Kerberos traffic on TCP/88. You know, sneaking it out however they have to through a variety of proxies and servers. Uh, you know, these guys are not messing around. They spent months analyzing the network to get in, and once they got in. They used SysInternal's PS Suite, which lets you use PS List to see the running processes like Task Manager. Now they could see all the processes running on the payment handling devices. And they could just steal the RAM from each process until they found out which one contained credit card numbers. <laughs> and this is all exploration. And once they figured it out, then they wrote custom malware to steal just the good stuff. And so just, just like the um, 
incident response team, they don't want the whole RAM or the whole hard drive. They want just the goodies. So they figured out how to zero in for just the credit card numbers and steal them and sneak them out. Yeah. No, I don't know about the, um, the near field, but with like the Apple Pay, isn't that like super encrypted? Yes, Apple Pay is much safer than a normal credit card. It uses the secure enclave chip on your phone, and it uses a unique uh, number for each transaction. So nobody ever gets your credit card number, and they can't reuse it for another transaction. Not even the so, merchant? Yes. So as far as I know, Apple Pay is very good. The design is very good. And in practice, for several years now, I've not really heard of any major hacks. So I, I think it should be much safer than using a physical credit card. Oh. And that certainly was the intention. Yeah. That doesn't prevent the, like an attacker from, like that one guy, that 16 year old attacked Apple servers. I mean, if they store your credit card data on an Apple Pay server somewhere and that gets attacked, they can still get your data, right? Oh, yes. If Apple has your credit card on their server, then that's another place it could get stolen from. That's true. And this is another a misconception. A lot of people come to me and say, I'm safe because I don't use online banking. And I say, well, that's not the main risk anyway. Uh, the main risk is someone will hack the bank and steal all the credit card numbers off of there, and you can't do anything about that. So, you know, this is like, you know, I can't lock my door, so I lock the window twice. I feel safer. <laughs> You're not really all that much safer. Yeah. Are these institutions ha uh, hashing their data, or shouldn't they be? Uh, well, you can hash. The question is about hashing data. You can hash certain kinds of data, like passwords, but you can't really hash credit card numbers because you have to keep sending them off to make more transactions. That's why it's, it's a problem. I mean, institutions really have to have plain text secrets, like their proprietary data, their customers' addresses and stuff, and they really have to protect them, and that's hard. Certainly, whenever you can, it's wiser not to collect data you don't need. But if you do have to collect it, then you really have valuable stuff. Yeah. But most of the merchants right now are tokenizing the credit card numbers. And there, there are yeah. lots of tokenizing methods that I can explain, but yeah. That's a good idea. And another thing, smaller companies like to do things like use Square so I never have the credit card number. Just let somebody else do the payment, then I don't have to take the responsibility. That's, of course, a good option for small companies, but big companies don't really have that. Anyway, these are, these are good points. So anyway, over then they spent three months stealing all the credit cards, millions of credit card records. This was the famous target breach, in my opinion. And so after 10 months of exploitation, they finally noticed that their stuff was being stolen. This is why uh, there's people walking around black hat with the t-shirt that says, Brian Krebs is my uh, IDS. <laughs> because most people have no ability to detect when they have been hacked. What happens is Brian Krebs, has, the journalist, has contacts at all the major banks. And when someone notices that a lot of stolen credit cards are coming from the same bank, they tell him, looks like somebody got hacked. And from the bank records, we can guess which company got hacked, which company used those credit cards recently. And he tells him, dude, you've been hacked. I can tell from the pattern of theft. And they often say, oh, no, we haven't. He says, oh, frequently. He tells someone, and they say, oh, no, we haven't. A week later, they say, oh, yes, we have. Because <laughs> <laughs> very few companies have network monitoring sufficient to detect this attack. But once you like embarrass them publicly and they really take a close look, they're able to find out that it is true. They've been hacked, and someone is stealing our stuff. So on you go. They finally, um, this guy finally noticed that their email was sending stuff to a foreign country. This is how Google started the whole thing. This was going, China was doing this to the whole world for maybe six years until 2010. Um, and everybody knew it was happening in the business, but nobody would admit it publicly because everyone was hoping to maintain their stock price by pretending that China hadn't hacked them and sort of covering it up. And Google got very, very, very angry, and the CEOs of Google decided to go public with the fact that they'd been hacked. And they did it because they saw network traffic going to China with their secrets. And they said, why is our stuff going to China? Who's doing that? It was pretty easy to detect, and that's what they finally did here. So uh, they hired a team. This is what you do if you're serious and you get hacked. You hire Mandiant or some other instant response company, and they charge you a pile of money and send a team to your site for a few weeks to figure it out and fix it. And that's usually the best answer if you're serious about fixing the problem. Telling your poor, beleaguered network administrators to fix it all by themselves is probably not that good. Yeah. Another question? Oh, no, I was just always curious because I never. And I'm never quite clear whether when they accuse China of hacking, whether they're accusing the government of carrying out operations or whether it's like individual hackers or groups within the country. This is a very good issue, attribution. You never, of course, know that it is the government of China and not random hackers. And there are, in fact, patriotic groups of criminal hackers in China hacking America to avenge insults. But China has been very, very blatant 
Their official new China policy is we're going to modernize China by stealing intellectual property from the West. They're not shy about it. They're not shy about admitting it. They don't feel like it's wrong. From their, in their system, it is not right for a person to invent something valuable and keep it secret and charge a bunch of money to use it. It should be donated to the public good. So they're quite blatant about it. And they've been doing it for 10 or 15 years. Um, now they're trying to cover it up a little bit because we're giving, talking about trade restrictions and such. But, but you know, we have a fundamental difference of ethics between us and the Chinese system. When they have stuff that we want to steal is when that starts to change. Yes, that's a very fair statement. I think once they have intellectual property we want to steal, then maybe we'll be stealing. We're certainly, by the way, we're the number one aggressor in cyberspace. We just don't like to talk about it. I mean, we're stealing and hacking everybody right and left. We whine about China's hacking us, and they occasionally say, you're hacking us 10 times as much, and I think that's probably true. Yeah. With the Stuxnet, um, wouldn't, shouldn't the initial incident responders have noticed something that Actually, you could, it spread months after the initial attack. attack. Yes, yeah, Stuxnet was carefully designed to be very subtle, and it fooled Iran for about two years. They, their nuclear isotope uh, separator stopped working, so they blamed their engineers. They thought they were sabotaging them. They started executing and torturing them to punish them for sabotaging the equipment. And when one of their computer scientists actually figured out what was going on, uh, the Israelis sent a couple of guys to blow up his car with a limpet mine. Or motorcycle, which is what they typically do, to make to shut him up and to keep them in the dark. And um, this is the world of espionage. You could very easily argue that this was all entirely moral and probably prevented a kinetic war. Uh, and up in the world of espionage, you decide to trade a small number of lives to save a large number of lives, and that's where we're at. Most of us in the private sector do not have to gamble with lives in that most in that direct way. But anyway. So they finally figured it out. They, instant, they figured everything out and then had an eradication event to kick them all out, which took two months for the complete incident response to click them out and make sure they were really out. So your investigation team hunts through all these systems and all the network traffic and you try to find all the malware on all the systems and understand what needs to be done to get rid of it all. Yeah? Sam, if you work for like a small company, like I've worked at small companies where, you know, they basically just say to the help desk guy or the, the system admin or Whatever, whatever poor IT guy just happens to be there, um, hey, uh, you know, you need to fix this. And the, the IT department's busy battling like the day-to-day -day stuff. Yes. And we don't even have like the fundamental understanding, maybe of like some basic security, but not at this level. Of course. And so they can't. The challenge there is culturally is selling the business the, the justification of hiring like a Mandian. And it seems like unfortunately that in many cases they have to be publicly shamed in a breach before they prioritize actually hiring a company like this to actually do something. Well, yes, and I'm not even sure I'd say anything's wrong with that. This is a big, important issue you brought up, which is if you're a small company, you can't possibly afford this expensive process, so you have some really simple process like we just restore from backup and try to get through the day, and our machines have some malware we can't get it all off and we just keep going. Um, then you, this is why you do threat modeling. If you're that small a company, maybe the nation states aren't going after you anyway. You really have the latest rocket designs or large numbers of credit card numbers. Maybe you're only being attacked by punks. You know, the same thing with your physical security, right? You have walls and locks on your doors, but how hard would it be to get in? If like a Russian spy wanted in, they could probably get in. So it's, you, every, this is always a case. There's no simple, no one size fits all for security. You have to figure out what the real business risk is and what you can afford and what you really can afford to stop. And you accept not stopping the stuff that you can't afford to stop. And that's the way it is in all the levels of security. How much do you know that your employees are not stealing stuff and betraying you? How much do you know the buildings aren't catching on fire? You know, you have many security problems and you can't stop them all. So you have to choose which ones would hurt me and are affordable to stop and stop them and not worry about the rest. It's, um, that's why they need good security people to advise them. And certainly, hiring Mandiant at what must be hundreds of thousands of dollars to come in and clean out a breach is only appropriate if you're a really big company. And you have assets that are worth much more than that. If you're a small company, then obviously, if the government wants, if the Chinese government wants to come steal your stuff, they're just going to do it and you can't do anything about it. That's, that's why, you know, it would be nice to imagine that there was some kind of cops out there that would save us from this stuff, but there isn't. The internet's just the Wild West. Everybody has to have their own security team. Anyway, so you got a remediation team. Once you have kicked them out, now you have, you have to do a containment. You have to find a way to kick them all out. 
and they had a sweeping eradication event in two days where you suddenly close, remove all the malware and close all the vulnerabilities and all the command and control channels, hopefully kicking them out completely. If you haven't analyzed it enough, you won't get all of their remote control channels and they'll just come back. And that's an issue. So anyway, and this of course all disrupts the business and costs money and so on. Um, anyway, so I think I'll take a break before we go on to this one. Um, I see it's 6.53. Let's take a 10 minute break and pick up at 7.05. So here's another one of the famous attacks. Just sort of the case history. This is all sort of to explain why we have this field. So um, this, this, by the way, it's worth mentioning. Uh, all the penetration testers I've heard give talks for the last several years say this is how you always do it. You send spearfish. In fact, uh, Johnny Xmas at Hope, who was very funny, talked about how all his clients have started telling him you can't use phishing. Because we know it'll work too well. And he said, well, why don't you fix it? I said, oh, that's too much bother. Go hack us another way. And he's like, well, you're paying the bill, but gee, this doesn't really seem to be very helpful if you don't fix the major problem and you get me to go find some other problem that doesn't matter, but whatever. So this, this spear phishing is the way to do it. And spear phishing, of course, is writing a custom email that will trick people into opening the file, clicking on the link, or whatever. So... Um, they started with the speakers at an industry conference, which is another reason why the, the stodgy places like banks won't let you go to security conferences or give talks or anything. So they got a list of all the speakers at a conference, and then they emailed them because they were clearly the security staff. And um, got one of, one of these guys opened a PDF file with Adobe Acrobat, so they got in and put in malware, and now they had control of Bob's machine. So two days later, they performed reconnaissance to see what Bob had been doing, and they found that Bob was connecting remotely through a VPN and stole his VPN credentials. <laughs> so now they could VPN in just like Bob does with developer credentials, which have high privileges, and they were able to use Mimi Cats, which is bloody awesome, and we use it a lot in the pen testing classes, which lets you get plain text passwords often without having to do any decryption because Microsoft leaves tokens all over the place that can be reversed fairly easily. And so now they got Bob's name and password, machine certificate, and the administrator password, which once again was the same on every machine because once again they all came from the same golden ghost image. So now he could just VPN from any system. And uh, they attacked the, by a VPN, and, but eventually made a mistake. These attackers were much less intelligent than the ones that attacked the previous company. Um, so they used remote desktop protocol, and if you do this, a window opens on your machine which shows you the Microsoft desktop or the server, but if you just close the window instead of logging out, it puts a suspicious entry in the event log, and they noticed that. This is, by the way, how the UFO hacker got caught. Um, James McKinnon or something from, uh, from Britain, he hacked the NSA for years, trying to find the proof that they had secret UFO information. And, um, he, and he said well, he found a machine that had a default password um, or no password at all, running Windows XP on 24-7 inside the NSA, and he said, I'd be on that thing using it, and the Chinese would be using it, and the Russians would be using it just for years, stealing all the NSA stuff. And then one day, some idiots used it during the daytime, and people were walking by seeing the mouse movie, and they said, they got us all busted. But <laughs> Anyway, um, so they caught him, and they found that this was coming in from Texas. So the attacker spent the next two weeks mapping everything, installing key loggers, and coming in to the Outlook web access email system, which is what pretty much everybody uses, and um, started accessing business critical data from a server, engineering data. Now there were access control lists on the server to prevent him from doing this, but he found out how to get administrator access and change the access control list, to give himself permission to get in. So that didn't work, so for four weeks he stole a bunch of data encrypted it in files, sent it out by FTP, and did really dumb stuff. Like, if you've taken the previous forensics class, you should know that you don't just delete a file and then run defrag to clear the traces. There's much better ways to do it. This guy did not know forensics very well, um, so that's what he was doing. That's noisy, and it doesn't actually erase the traces. Something like eraser or steganography would be a whole lot better. But um, anyway, so that two weeks after he Began stealing data. The company put in a SIM, sort of like uh, you know, uh, uh, Alien Vault or um, Splunk or something, and they were able to see VPN connections coming in all over the place that weren't supposed to be there. Like Bob is connecting from multiple machines at the same time. This is not good. So uh, 
Now they disabled Bob's account. He started using somebody else's account, so they figured that out. And now they realize, you know, we've got a hacker. We've got to get somebody to fix this. So they get a real IR team in, and they found uh, the compromised and the network traffic from the beacons of the remote access Trojan he was using. They tracked it down through Outlook Web Access, and they enforced a password change, but they didn't. They told the users to change their password, but they did not force them to, so the users didn't all change their password, so that didn't do any good, so they had to do another global password change and actually lock you out if you didn't change your password within 24 hours, and that finally got them out of there. So it was a much simpler network, a much dumber attacker, but still a serious problem, and you had to track it down to get rid of it. So this is the last bit here. Um, the, this is the way the attack life cycle works. This is the general stages through which it happens. Your initial compromise comes in with spear phishing or something or web vulnerability where you find some kind of weakness and you take over one machine and it's usually not a very high value machine and you usually do not get administrator access. You get user access on one server, a public facing server or on one user's desktop. Then you put on malware and get remote control of it so you have, can spend some time on that machine. And now you have to somehow escalate your privileges. You have to get administrator access of whatever box you've got. So you try to pass the hash if you can find local password hashes or do password cracking or find some kind of exploit. These things, uh, ways to escalate from a local user to administrator are a dime a dozen. There's a bunch in Metasploit that work almost all the time on Windows. And in Linux, it's a fairly elementary um, technique to find ways to escalate on almost any version if it's more than six months old. Um, then you do internal recon. You hunt through the system trying to find out what it's got and what's worth taking. Then you set up staging servers and you start stealing data and you complete your mission. And in the meantime, you have to do a lot of this looping around. You have one system, you scan everything you can see, you move laterally and take over whatever else you can, and then you scan more, hunting through the network, trying to find the goodies. And this is, like in the target, this took months to find your way through that big complicated network to get to the goodies. So it's not a smash and grab tack, but there's a high payoff at the end if you do it. So I got some coats as review questions of this stuff. So let me bring them up. I mean, you can get extra credit if you get the most of these right. So the three people that get the highest score will get three points. Anyway, so here's the glorious Kahoot questions. Okay. Which IR team removes the attacker? OK, it's the remediation team. That's remediation, kicking them out. All right, good, everyone got that. Which one performs damage assessment? OK, that's the investigation, good. Which item is any observable occurrence on a network? OK, that's an event. All right, which one is a violation of security policy? That's an incident. All right, does not necessarily mean it's a breach. All right, so here are the winners. AE, I know who that is. Drew, I know who that is. And Jeff Tom, I know good. I know these people's names. Good. So those are the winners, and that's the only Kahoot today. So I'll uh, just say, what you should do, you should uh, do the first couple quizzes, the next couple chapters, and start doing the homework. The first couple projects will be easy if you've taken any of my other classes. First, you've got to get Collies and Windows going. Then you're going to steal, take RAM from the machine and analyze it using a few different tools. First, Bulk Extractor, which is very much like that target malware. Bulk Extractor just looks for readable strings that look like credit card numbers and email addresses and such. And then volatility is a much more sophisticated tool that can analyze the RAM and find things like which commands are being executed in a command prompt and uh, registry keys and all sorts of goodies from it. And then uh, you can start examining the registry, which is where a lot of the goodies are. And there will be much more projects coming, but those are the six that I've got ready to go. That's enough for about a month, so start doing some of them. And uh, anybody got any questions about anything? Yeah. I've already got a uh, virtual machine, 18204 Kali. Yeah, you already got one. You should be able to just use it to finish the first one. That's what I say. The first yeah. two you probably already got. So you do not have to make a new machine for this class. Any old machine is probably fine. Um, as my first two are probably gimmies, and then you can just start doing the others. But if you don't have a machine, there are instructions there to make a machine.
We are going to use virtual machines. I was hoping to switch to all cloud machines, but I'm having trouble finding a good cheap Windows cloud hosting service. So anyway, um, in the, by the way, if you want to do be really cool, quit using virtual machines. I'm trying to get them out of my classes. VMware is kind of for the birds. It's of no importance in the real world. What matters is cloud stuff. All this stuff should just be on Amazon. And we're trying to get Amazon credit to give the students this stuff. You should just be putting everything in the cloud. That's the way it's really done. And I'm hoping to put all my projects in the cloud, but I haven't quite figured out the right way to do that yet. Yeah. So can you just announce the club? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, so the club. <coughs> I put it up here. There is a cybersecurity club. And you go here, you'll find out what they're doing. And we have a meeting coming up soon and all that. So check it out. They're going to have stuff happening. You got anything to say about it? Um, yes. Uh, if you want to go to our website, it's ccsfcyberclub.org. Uh, we have our first meeting on Tuesday, August 28th, 3 to 6 p.m., Science 37. So it's going to be more of a networking event. So if you want to come and meet other students from daytime, weekends, online, um, I'm hoping to make it a Zoom so everyone can connect. And um, there will be food as well, so please come hungry. Yeah, and they got a lot of things happening. They're doing competition teams and a server club and all sorts of stuff. So, And now that we have like a properly established presence in the website. We're starting to get corporate donations and stuff. So, you know, what happened is I started this security stuff like just a crazy hacker, and now some management types have moved in to make it professional, which it really sorely needed because my version of things is just sort of like throwing it together out of junk. And now Beta. things get more professional. Steve is one of the many, several people who have come in. Steve and Richard Wu and Carrie have come in to like add some management to our security program, which it really needed.